Hey guys, I'm Tasha. Hey listeners, this is Guni. And you're tuned in to Dutch F the Podcast, where we chat and explore all things on integrative medicine. So Dr. Khalid Elson is a naturopathic physician in Portland, Oregon, in the US. His medical practice specializes in men's health, autoimmune conditions, erectile dysfunction, prostate issues, nutritional counseling, therapeutic fasting, performance optimization, and longevity. Dr. Khalid utilizes a combination of naturopathic and conventional treatment approaches, along with advanced laboratory biomarkers to craft individual treatments to approach his patients. So Dr. Khalid, welcome to Dot of the Podcast. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited. I'm excited to talk to both of you. So I guess to kick off our conversation, I, we're really actually curious to know how you got into your journey to become a naturopathic physician. Yeah. So thanks for asking me. It actually started with my mother. So my mother, she was diagnosed with breast cancer a while ago, and she actually kept it a secret from us for a while because you know mm-hmm. how mothers are, they want to yeah. make sure that their children are not stressing about them. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, when I found out that she was dealing with breast cancer, it was a little bit further along in the journey. And she had already exhausted conventional medicine and it was no longer accomplishing what she, what she wanted it to accomplish. And at that point, she kind of transitioned over to doing self-care and quote unquote natural therapies. Mm-hmm. And when she transitioned over there, I became a primary caretaker, right? And we actually yeah. extended her life about a year and a half longer than what conventional medicine total was possible. Oh, wow. So that right there yeah. opened my eyes to the power of natural medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, she eventually passed away. But one thing that I always say is that had we had access to qualified and knowledgeable nat- natural doctors, or at least doctors who are trained in alternative cancer therapies, mm-hmm. I have no doubt that she would still be alive, you know, wow. because we were two people with no medical training, just like doing things that we were reading online, mm-hmm. piecemealing different pieces of treatment together. But if we had some type of guidance from somebody who was actually trained in this, then I, again, I have no doubt that the outcome would have been different. Sure. Yeah. So is this how you started studying naturopathy? Kind of the drive that got you yeah. that, to that. Yeah, so during that experience, I changed my life. I changed my lifestyle. At the time I became vegan, I'm no longer vegan. I became very, very adamant about like just treating my body well. Mm-hmm. And I just saw mm-hmm. the transition or the changes that was happening in her body by doing so. And then also yeah. in myself as well. And so that's when I knew that I wanted to do something like this. Somehow I wanted to tell people about natural medicine and just like the power of just of diet and lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And, but I, did, I knew that I didn't want to just be another random person online telling people just to eat vegetables. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many of them out there. So. <laughs> there are so many of them out there and, you know, they have their place and they, sh- they share valuable information, but I knew yeah, that I yeah. wanted to come from a place of authority and be able to speak knowledgeably and accurately about what I do and why it is effective. And I actually, it's funny, I learned about naturopathic medicine from an MD. Um, It was actually a black woman who said that back in the day when she went through school, she would have gone through naturopathic medicine herself. However, she chose not to because she was a black woman in the United States and she needed a degree that was a little bit more secure. Yeah. So tell us more about what it is about naturopathy that even though you have people who actually really believe in this, but decide not to pick that as an option. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. I know this is the same around the world, probably in different ways, but the reality is with um, natural therapies or naturopathic medicine, traditional healers, whatever you want to call them, they don't get the same respect that the Mm. people who are conventional medical doctors do. It also comes with, for some physicians, lower pay with stigma, the lack of respect. And um, if we're talking specifically about the United States, we know that the United States has a long and ugly history of racial discrimination Mm -hmm. and um, marginalization. And Mm. so if we're speaking about this woman specifically, she Mm. knew that history. It was a while ago. So she was also a little bit, it was a little bit closer to the time when it was pretty bad. 
-hmm. and in making the decision between going the route that she wanted to go and yeah. and going with naturopathic medicine she went the conventional medical route because again she knew that as a black woman trying to be a doctor in order to get the respect that she needed to get and in order sure. to achieve the income that she wanted to achieve she needed to be um a conventional medical doctor sorry about the beeping that's, that's oh, okay i was gonna <laughs> ask you like okay yeah, she, had to <laughs> yeah. go, she had to go the conventional medical route but that unfortunately that stigma is changing yeah there is still a stigma there still are financial hurdles that people go through but mm -hmm. The reality is, is that more and more people are realizing that naturopathic physicians are actual physicians. We are medically trained and mm -hmm. we are, we're the real deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very much so. I think it's great that now we have the transparency and also the access to get knowledge of not just uh, the traditional Western reactive care type of approach <laughs> to health and wellness. So like, I guess, how, how is naturopathy different or what, what, what is unique about naturopathy? How do we, how do we identify in a nutshell? <laughs> yeah. And so in naturopathic medicine, we'd like to talk about something called the therapeutic order. And so with the therapeutic order, it's kind of like a pyramid or a stepwise progression in which the way that we look at a patient and naturopathic medicine and conventional medicine, we're brothers and sisters. Like we're not against mm. conventional medicine. We just have a different framework with which we approach the situation and approach mm -hmm. disease or sickness. So with the therapeutic order, what that means is when we see somebody with a condition or when we see an issue, we start at the lowest level and slowly work our way up a pyramid towards the top level. And so for example, the base level are what we call the fundamentals of health. And so when we talk about the fundamentals of health or the barriers to health, what that means is we're talking about diet, nutrition, mm -hmm. exercise, lifestyle. We're talking about drinking water. We're talking about all of those foundational things to health and wellness. And it's our solid, solid belief that without changing those right there, you're not really getting to the root cause of many issues and, many, and the cause of many people's suffering. And then what happens is we slowly walk our way up that pyramid. So once we address the lifestyle and nutrition, we can step our way up the pyramid and then we may move on to herbs or supplements or nutrients. Mm -hmm. Then we may move our way up to some type of physical medicine, some type of physical um, manipulation. Then we may move our way up to a pharmaceutical and then we move to surgery. So when you say physical medicine, what is it exactly that you mean? So naturopathic doctors are trained in naturopathic ma manipulations. A okay. lot of my a lot of my professors were chiropractors or are okay. chiropractors. All right. Okay. So in um in school, I I've learned to adjust people, and I can adjust people, and All it right. is within my scope of practice to do naturopathic adjustments. So it's um, interesting that it comes after supplements. It actually comes before supplements. Ah, okay. Just, All right. I just I, like... I messed up that order, but yeah, it, so it comes before right. supplements. Okay. Um, but again, the the idea is like you don't start with mm. the pharmaceutical. You don't yeah. start with the supplement, right? You right. want to do everything for the fit because the whole idea of naturopathic medicine is that we're getting to the root cause of disease, which means you've got to peel back the layers of the onion mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what's actually going on with somebody's body. Yeah. And then mm. also, once you peel back those layers, we also talk about barriers to care or barriers mm, yeah. to health, which means that we're working to remove those barriers to give the body the tools that it needs to heal itself. Because mm. the body is always in a state where it's trying to achieve homeostasis, is always in a state where it's trying to heal. So no matter how badly you feel and how crummy your body feels, your body is in a state where it's working and fighting to get back to a place of health, wellness, and happiness. And sometimes it's more complicated for other people, depending on your, on your case. But what mm. you need to do is give your body the tools and the time and space to be able to get itself back to a place of homeostasis or a place of happiness. Because that mm. is, as long as we're alive, that is what our body is trying to do. That's such a beautiful way of seeing the body, right? To just be happy. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, so simplified that's, that's, when you say it that way. That's what it's here for. The body's mm -hmm. here to try to be happy and is, is here to try to help us like do what we want to do. Mm -hmm. And so our yeah. body is just 24 seven 
working towards that goal and yeah. we get in the way. For yeah. Sure. Um, as you mentioned it, there are other things. I mean, we, we all predisposed to a certain extent to get to, to remove those barriers or not to. And as we read your bio, the fact that you focus on men's health is quite highlighted. Why did you choose to, to specialize in, in men, men's health? So I do a lot of work with men because when we think about gaps or differences in the way people access healthcare, we look at men and the reality is that we don't go to the doctor as much. <laughs> without, without a wife or a partner pushing us into the office, we yeah. often avoid those things. And I do men's healthcare specifically to create a space or a safe space for men. Mm-hmm. When the reality mm-hmm. is, is that the issues that are affecting men are the same things that are affecting everybody else. Yeah. Right. It's, yeah. I do a lot of work with diabetes. And so men are diabetic at alarming rate. So again, I say that I do men's health care. Yeah. But when I say that, what I'm really doing is saying, hey, men, fellas, come into my office. I'm another gentleman and you can come speak to me about your erectile dysfunction. You can come speak to me about the fact that yeah. you're urinating throughout the night and you all these other things. And guess what? At the root cause, it's probably the same thing that is affecting the women around the world as well. Men have hormones as well. So your hormones can go out of whack as well. But the difference is we don't bleed every month. So we don't have a big, like red, the irony of using <laughs> a red flashing sign. <laughs> but yeah, like a reminder have, every month. <laughs> we don't have a reminder every month that, hey, something is off. We don't have that. But the reality is that men's hormones can go out of whack. I, I really love how you just framed this because, I mean, as a woman, in my recent years, I've come to appreciate the fact that we have like a monthly cycle and like we, that's our indicator that we haven't been treating ourselves right. But before that, I used to cringe and hate the fact that I would be in pain and suffering in that, that one week of um, having my period not realizing that it was just there to indicate and tell me like, hey, listen, you're not taking care of yourself and this is my way to force you to rest. But now when you put it this way, it's like maybe guys are more alone in in this process (laughs) than than women are. The one thing I'd say there is that guys are pretty oblivious. (laughs) Well, it's no comment. We didn't say it. I don't know if we if I if I give us enough credit to say that we're there on that journey with you. <laughs> but yeah, I, I digressed a little bit. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you, you bring up a good point because society and the messages that we tell people, we tell young women that menstrual cycles are something to be ashamed of. Menstrual mm. cycles are mm. something that are an inconvenience, something that the men need to know zero or nothing about because it is a woman issue. When in reality is that it is part of life. It is what allows us to procreate and have life. Mm-hmm. And it, it shouldn't be something that's in the closet. And mm-hmm. these yeah. practitioners should be hopefully men who are competent and or women who are able to be empathetic and provide adequate and just like quality advice rather than just saying, here, take some Advil and, you know, mm. suck it oh, up for two yeah. weeks. But that's a fair point. Yeah. I think education and awareness plays such a big part. And um, what what is something that you see the most on men's reproductive health? With men, something that happens pretty commonly is going to be low testosterone with men's health. And depending on what's going on with the male, they may be dealing with fatigue, weight gain, they may be dealing with general malaise or just like feeling crummy. And there could be a number of issues. So testosterone is our main hormone and it helps to build muscle. It helps us to produce sperm. It helps give us energy, plays a vital role in our ability to procreate as our ability to regulate our weight. It controls Mm -hmm. our our hair growth. The analogy I like to use with hormones is that it's kind of like a football team in that you've got all of these different players. And for example, testosterone may be the quarterback or the running back, but then you also have sex hormone binding globulin, DHT, estradiol, or estrogen. You have all these different okay. hormones. If one thing doesn't run, then it has a cascading effect downstream. Mm. So if you have a football team, the quarterback may be working perfectly well, but if your receiver has a broken ankle and the play's not going to work. Like if any one of those players are not working properly, 
then yeah. the entire play or the entire game is not going to run and you're not going to win. Wow. And so when we think about how you address people with hormonal issues, we've got to go back and dissect the team and figure out where the problem is. And then once we fix that and the team starts to run again, like a well-oiled machine, because again, you've got to take a step back and say, okay, where is the issue on this hormonal pathway? What is, what is going wrong? Yeah. So you're looking at it in a very integrative way of seeing how your different hormones are working. Um, so I guess that you're creating this space for men to come and speak to you with regards to reproductive health. Um, do men really feel comfortable to speak to a naturopathic doctor versus a medical doctor? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think what makes naturopathic medicine and what makes what I do slightly different is that I ask those questions, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in finding the root cause or doing prevention. Again, I do a lot of work with diabetes. And because I know that diabetes is A, a silent killer, which means it is asymptomatic and people live with this in a state where they're pre-diabetic for many years without mm -hmm. actually knowing it, right? And yeah. so because I do a lot of work in that area, I'm in my first visit with patients, in my first visit with people, I'm saying, hey, how's your penis working, right? Mm -hmm. How, you know, are you having difficulty with libido? Are you having difficulty with erections? Yeah. And if so, what is the problem? Are you too stressed? Are you struggling with fertility? And then when, I, when we talk about fertility, it's like, yeah, I know that your wife is going through all these treatments and your wife is stressed out about mm. this, but guess what? Your semen actually does play a role in how, how likely you guys are to get pregnant because there's yeah. two, it takes two to tango. Exactly. Yeah. I guess in that line, right? What is the role that men play in infertility when they're trying to get pregnant in a, in a couple? Like, what is the extent of it? Men do play a huge role in it. Unfortunately, is not spoken about enough. So when there's an issue with fertility, guess whose fault it is? It's the woman's. But that's yeah. not the full case. So it, the reality is, it's actually kind of even. Yeah. As I said, it takes two to tango. The man is bringing half of the equipment, half yeah, of the sure. um, reproductive. <laughs> yeah. Half of the equipment. I like it. <laughs> yes. Yes. And if your equipment is not functioning right at the construction site, then that's guess true. what? You have, you have, you have a role to play there. <laughs> if you bring faulty equipment to the construction site, then yeah. the job is not going to get done. Yeah. yeah. And so when you tell them that they have an equal responsibility, how do they usually react? In my experience, everybody is super open to it because mm -hmm. when we think about infertility, you usually have people who are coming to your office, they're in a place where they are frustrated, they're motivated, they want to become pregnant. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes men feel helpless in that situation because they see their partner going through all these treatments and they've been told, or they, or even if they haven't been told, they just think that, you know, again, I don't play a role in that. Mm -hmm. And so at least in my practice that when you educate people properly, then the change follows. Yeah, I guess the patients that come, they're already ready to make that change. That, but I also have like, so I, I'm thinking about somebody who came to my office about a week ago. They, again, they were never told. So I have, I have a gentleman who came to my office just for a general visit, general wellness. And then it comes up that him and his wife are trying to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And it comes up that his wife has PCOS. And so the conversation switches and I'm saying, what we need to start doing is working on your health so that you bring your A game mm -hmm. and B, support her PCOS naturally. So again, like in this situation, mm -hmm. he didn't come to me for infertility, but as you, again, as you ask the questions, you peel yeah. back the layers of the onions, you realize that he is struggling with that. Sorry to interrupt. That just that No, no. Me. It's actually a great example because when you look at healthcare in a holistic and an integrative way, that's what happens. So do you mind just sharing factors that kind of affect uh, infertility in men? Yeah. So first and foremost, their underlying health status. Yeah. So if mm -hmm. you are overweight, hypertensive, if you mm -hmm. are diabetic, if you have any type of chronic disease, all of these things mm -hmm. are going to affect your semen production and your semen quality. And so mm -hmm. first and foremost, people need to address their underlying health status um, when they're talking about fertility. You also want to address things that are coming from the outside. 
right? So you want to get the toxins out of your world. You want to get rid of, um, start use, stop using so much plastic, start using more glass and stainless steel. If you're smoking, mm. if you have any of those unhealthy life, un- unhealthy habits or addictions, you definitely want to take care of that. Um, mm. You also have stress and trauma to the testicular area. And yeah. so that may mean if you're getting hit in the testicles and stop getting hit in the testicles, but also <laughs> wow. more low level things, right? Low level <laughs> things like bike riding, having a computer on your lap, you um, know? Um, wow. Mm-hmm, yeah. So actually people who are um, men or professional cyclers actually have uh, most sperm counts and have difficulty Ooh. with fertility because you are on that, you're on the seat and you're constantly putting pressure down there. You're constantly warming up, warming it up higher than it needs to be down there. Oh, and so okay. one of those things, if you are also dealing with infertility is you want to get off of a bicycle. If you are a cyclist, you mm-hmm. want to wear looser pants, mm-hmm. right? And you want to stop having your computer directly on your lap. And again, it kind of makes it, we don't think about it, but it makes sense in that you want to decrease the amount of trauma, pressure, heat, mm-hmm external stimuli that are going to your testicular area because that is where that's the that's the that's the production factory okay um, interesting. Mm-hmm. so you you would say that like all these factors affect um would they affect the sperm quality like yeah they can or, like absolutely so when, when we think about sperm there are a few things that you want to think about so you have the the quantity mm-hmm. you have the morphology which is like the shape right so you want you want your you want them to be the correct shape. You have motility. So motility means you want them to be able to move correctly. Like mm-hmm. if they can't swim, then they can't make it to the egg. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. um, you have something called agglutination or stickiness, right? So if all of them kind of stick together, then again they can't swim. And so that brings me to the last thing, which is if you're dealing with infertility, then make sure that you get a semen analysis. That way you can address, um, you can know exactly what the issue is. And then there are targeted ways that you can address those issues. But until you know exactly what you're dealing with or struggling Mm. with, you're kind of throwing darts in the dark. Mm. And what would be your message for the men that are not necessarily aware that they have a part to do? And as they are trying to get pregnant, what are three things that they can start doing and three things they can stop doing if they want to help get pregnant? That's a fantastic question, Guni. For people who are actively trying to conceive, it comes down to the same thing. So if you take care of your underlying health status, you will take care of a lot of issues and they, they will start to resolve themselves naturally. So what I'll say are three things that you can do. First, you want to take care of your diet and nutrition. And within your diet and nutrition, you want to achieve tight glycemic control, in my opinion. And so what that's going to mean is keeping your glucose levels, your sugar levels within a healthy range, which which is below 105, in my opinion. Um, You want to have your fasting glucose somewhere in your 80s, low 90s. And you want to make sure that you're avoiding spikes and dips. And so by doing that, you're also controlling your insulin levels, and making sure that you are decreasing and controlling inflammation throughout your entire body. Two, you're going to want to have some general supplementation. So a few things that I recommend to to pretty much everybody is to get a good multivitamin on board, Mm -hmm. get a good methylated B complex, higher dose fatty acids, taking omega-3s, fish oils, upwards of two to four grams a day some vitamin D, you're taking a probiotic and yeah, and then possibly um, a few nourishing herbs. And so these are things that are helpful for everybody across the board. Mm -hmm. And it's also going to help support fertility. And then the last thing, or then um, I'll give two more things. So that's just what I do. The um, the other thing is I'm going to recommend a detox. Mm -hmm. And so detox Mm -hmm. can be multiple things, Mm -hmm. avoiding whatever it is that's mentally and spiritually aggravating you. Are you physically stressed where you are exposing yourself to toxins? Figure out what the external things that you're putting into your body and you're exposing yourself to that are causing stress and inflammation on your body and then quote unquote detox from those things. 
And then the last thing, the bonus is to go to a doctor. Mm -hmm. If you are not going to the doctor, you don't know what you're addressing. So again, get something that's going to look under the hood and give you that objective information so that you know what is going on. That makes a, a lot of sense, actually. And yeah, I think it's just general health practices that we should all be practicing, right? But it just goes to show that to reduce yourself of disease or get rid of it, it's a lifestyle and a lifetime investment because it has lasting effects. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And as we're thinking about fertility and as we're thinking about lifetime effects, you also need to start thinking about the generational effects. And so a so lot true. of people who are struggling with infertility, a lot of people who are struggling with health issues, when you have children, what, you, what we often forget is a lot of times we are absorbing and bringing on the traumas and learn behaviors that we, that we picked up from our parents. Oftentimes mm -hmm. we are modeling and are picking up a few of those things from our parents and or whomever helped to raise us. Yeah. And so now as we think about ushering through the next generation, it's mm -hmm. so important that as, as parents, we break that cycle with us and you address your underlying health issues. You do what, it, what you can and what's in your power to get as healthy as possible. And by doing so, then you are, you are starting to teach those habits, practices, values to your children. And you're yeah. breaking that cycle of chronic disease in your lineage so that your children and their children don't have to deal with it or have significantly lower chances of dealing with it. Yeah, I don't think most of us reflect about it in a deep way like that. It's also about prevention in, in general, like what type of life do you want to live? And you want to be your best self regardless so that when you actually come to a point of even wanting to procreate, you're on your A-game. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for listening to part one of our discussion with Dr. Khalid. Part two drops next week where you can expect to hear more on how naturopathic physicians get certified as doctors and how they fit into the overall medical landscape in America. With that said, if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and select that follow or subscribe button. For now, stay safe and we'll see you next week.